I don't know how have the full bio on Dr. Brooks, but I know this. We know this through his contribution in various forums. He's a retired medical doctor and um, I guess some area of specialization. But I also think he worked as a pathologist too as well in that office before he um, he retired. He's also a Bible teacher, a theologian. He, he was a trained um, Bible teacher and theologian. I think he has a doctorate or more than one in theology. But he comes primarily doing this study, a doctor looking at Psalm 22 and what our Lord went through. Um, he is qualified to walk us through that in terms of his professional training and experience and his knowledge of the word, not just knowledge, but sheer overview as a Protestant and evangelical. Uh, believe, he believes in what we call verbal plenary inspiration of the scripture. He doesn't treat the scripture lightly, but he uh, sees it as a final authority. And those of us who are familiar with Back to the Basics know that we treasure the word of God. And so it's our privilege. We are blessed to have him around to walk us through things we would never know or have somebody we have confidence to explain to us. So take your notes, prepare for Q&A as we welcome our dear brother, Dr. Victor Brooks, to start his presentation. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we start to roll, just let me give you a little note as to what this big word that you are seeing means. Um, <clears throat> there is anatomy. This means that we have structure. You have a nose so you can smell. Uh, you have hands that you can hold things. And then there's physiology. So physiology means function. You can function if your anatomy is there. We also have something called biochemistry. That's what happens at the cellular level. And we will look at the cellular level when we do the, the, uh, the segment on the physiology of the person. Now, what is pathology? Pathology is when your anatomy has gone bad or your physiology has gone bad or your biochemistry is gone bad. No, whether you know it or not, that's what pathology is. So, so don't get frightened for that big word. Pathology is anatomy gone bad, physiology gone bad, or biochemistry gone bad. And when that happens, you get something called disease. You experience disease. We like to pronounce the word disease, but basically we can say that you experience disease when these features uh, are not working as they ought. Now, one Sunday morning, some years ago at a break and bread meeting, Psalm 22 was introduced into the service. And a prompt perusal seemed to suggest that Psalm gave a predictive, poetic description of the suffering of the Lord Jesus on the cross as detailed in the eight chapters in the gospel which record this subject. A cursory glance suggested that this passage could reasonably be considered under the following headings. Psychological, physiological, pathological, and there's psalmodic praise. There's a praise section at the end, which is the whole point of the psalm. Also, since then, I have sought from time to time to develop thoughts to enhance my understanding of this very complex psalm. Psalm 23 is quite easy to follow. Psalm 24 is quite easy, but Psalm 22 is a little bit more difficult to comprehend. You have to make a greater effort to do this. In this series of Back to the Bible Lectures, we are not seeking to exegete the text of the psalm fully. Now, in recent Back to the Bible Lecture, we have been exploring several aspects of the message of the doctrine of salvation. <laughs> in this series of lectures, we will attempt to highlight how a lot of the basic medical sciences is accurately described in the Bible centuries before our discovery 
of this information. And as we read the, some medicine into the fabric of the theology that we have been uh, discussing, we will stress the accuracy of Bible prophecy and the harmony of the Holy Scriptures as we always do. And so today, as we begin our series on Psalm 22, the Psalm of the Cross, as it is called, we do so with some thoughts insight, entitled The Pathology of the Cross. Instead of only having a basic theological discussion today, we will engage in what I will call a little clinical pathological conference. Don't get frightened. We, we got to bring you on slowly. So we start with a death certificate. I was asked recently on this same class, what would you write as a diagnosis on a death certificate for Jesus if you were given that task? And my diagnosis is that he laid down his life for a sheep at the request of his father because it pleased the father. Now, whenever you make a diagnosis, you have to have some evidence or some rationale for making that, that decision. You have to have a reason for making that decision. And my basis when I came to that diagnosis was that it says in Daniel chapter 9 that the Lord would come and be cut off or die, but not for himself. And it says in John 10, that he himself said, I lay down my life for the sheep. That's verse 7, 15, John. And it also says, again, he says, I lay down my life. And then he said, I lay down of myself. And then he said, this is the commandment have I received of my father. This is quite exciting because he kept these promises. That, that's what's so important. That's why we love him so. We love people that keep their promises. And he kept his promises. Also, the, the, the scripture in Isaiah 53, it says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. In other words, he said that he said that he was doing this because it was a command from his father. So it fits in with the scripture in Isaiah 53, where it says that uh, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Um, from the get-go, I want to say loudly and clearly that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, according to the scriptures, as taught in 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 3. But he did not die by suffocation like all other persons that died in the crucifixion. The biblical record indicates clearly that he laid down his life as he promised and predicted to do. And I will say categorically that I do not agree with the opinions of the cause of his death as exposed by many medical experts. And whereas I'm not disputing the expertise, clinical acumen, or reasoning of these opinions, none of them are supported by the biblical record. And I rest my case solely on the biblical record, which indicates that Jesus died because he laid down his life, as promised in John chapter 10. My position is that the biblical record should overrule medical knowledge, expertise, clinical acumen, or reasoning. My position is that as the creator of the body's homeostatic mechanisms, we'll be going to this in a lot of detail in the session of physiology. He was in control of those life-preserving methods at all times during his ordeal on the cross. Basically, just to give a little taste of homeostasis, homeostasis, if something's going wrong in your body, if you, if you walk into a room and a lot of smoke, your body will respond by getting you out of that area. If it gets cold, your body will respond in some, some way that you will warm yourself. If it gets too hot, your body will tell you, tell the brain to tell some part of you to fix the situation. Now, he made these mechanisms. He made them. And having made them, I believe firmly that he was able to use them when he chose. We read in John 19 that when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, this is quite unusual. We also see the same thing in Mark 15. This is unusual because dying people tend to gasp for breath. They do something called chain strokes breathing. 
They don't shout out on the tail. And one of the most significant details about the death of Jesus, as presented in both Mark 15 and John 19, is that he gave up the ghost. And the Amplified Version puts it very elegantly for 1537. He uttered a loud cry, breathed out his last, voluntarily, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body in submission to his father's plan. In other words, he sent to where? Or he laid aside his spirit. This indicates that Jesus was totally in control of his destiny unto the end. And he gave up his life because he willed it. When he willed it, and as he willed it. In 15 other Bible verses, where the phrase gave up the spirit or yield up the spirit is used to translate the Hebrew or Greek word meaning breathe out or expire. There are 15 other verses. And this is true of the description in Mark 15, 37 and Luke 23, 46. But in Matthew 27, 50 and John 19, 30, there, this phrase is translated differently. It is translated send away. The word you means send away or deliver over. The word translated Yielded in Matthew 20, yielded in Matthew 27 50 means dismiss. Even in dying, the Lord demonstrated his royal authority. He did, he did the dismissing, not his enemy or, or adversary, because no one could take his life from him. That's what he particularly said in verse 18 of chapter 10. John. For us, resting in so critic fanatics like me we would say that he was not dismissed, but he retired out. And, and those men of us on the, on the, from the West Indies on the broadcast, we will know what it is, as we used to say in Barbados in my day as a teenager, we know it is to be staked out. We used to call it, you stake out. You stake them out. You know, you go to a village to play against a, a group and you stake them out. You, you bat and you bat and you bat and you bat until the boys run home because they can't get you out. They can't get you dismissed. Well, he was not dismissed. He retired. While many of the physical signs preceding death were present, and that is obvious from reading the text, I believe that Jesus did not die by physical factors ending his ability to live, but that he gave up his life of his own accord as he promised. His last statement, into your hands I commit my spirit, seems to show that Jesus' death occurred by giving himself up. So the death of Jesus was different from that of any other man. God gave man the breath of life. Jesus was the man. Remember that. He's the second Adam, but he gave up that breath after enduring the curse of the fall to the fullest on the cross so that we might have the spiritual breath of life to enable us to live eternally. You know, Jesus promised Martha that if you believe in him, that we will never die. Even if we die, we will live. Because once you have eternal life, you cannot die spiritually. So even though you die, in the scripture, the death of the saint is called falling asleep. Called fallen asleep. The Lord chose to die so that we might be partakers of the divine nature. This is a verse that we have to remember memorize as children. We are back in 1969. And uh sometimes we take some scriptures very lightly, but this is exactly very, 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 very powerful uh verse. This is what the devil wanted. He wanted to be divine. He wanted to be like God. He's saying, I'm not saying that we are God. I am saying that he died so that we can be godly. He made provision so that we can be godly. We are now partakers of the divine nature. We have a, the essence that makes it possible for us to be godly. That's the point we're making. We, we often read things and, you know, we read, read things so often that sometimes it almost becomes meaningless. 
but when we get in on occasions like this, when we really meditate seriously, we can see that there's more in the mortar than the pestle, as we say back home. There's more in the mortar than the pestle. So it's not just that little wooden thing in the pestle. There's more in there. That's why you have a mortar and pestle anyway. You put things in it and you and you crush them. And there's more in the water than the pestle. So when you read 2 Peter 1, 4, that says that we are partakers of the divine nature, remember that you got that privilege because the Lord Jesus Christ died. That's the point we're making. Um, so I've just shown you why I came to my diagnosis. That was the first point that we want to make. We, we're going to speak about the Lord's death and we have certain beliefs that we will expound. We have to back it up by scripture. That's the way we teach. The other thing that we want to raise, and I'm still warming up. I haven't started yet. I'm trying to take my guard at the wicket or you can say I am marking out my run. Uh, so I haven't started yet. You just having a little warm-up fun, okay? So bear with me. In this lecture, one in these lectures, what we want to do is dispel and put away from our minds the visual images that we have received throughout our lives, from the paintings and the movies and the pictures that we have seen. Now, when I was doing my master's in Christian education, I learned that what happens in this country is that people from the various denominations, they actually have a meeting. And at that meeting, they will decide what a three-year-old boy should know about knowing the art. And what a five-year-old girl should know about the same thing. And what a seven-year-old boy should know about Joseph. And the psychologists and the educators and everybody, they come to that conclusion. And then each denomination goes away and write their Sunday school manuals with the paintings and the pictures that they perceive. That is what should be taught. So you've all seen the picture of Noah's Ark, and there are two giraffes sticking the neck out above the the the, the, par the parapet, you know, the deck. That that's the thing that they say children of that age should know. Okay. Uh, give me a second to say a little bit uh, about giraffes and the long necks because giraffe is something that. Is amazing. The giraffe is the only mammal, only animal that actually has valves in its carotid arteries. The arteries that go from the heart to the brain. They actually have valves in that artery. Normally, you will find valves in the veins of your legs to help you help in pushing the, the blood out from your legs back to your heart. Do you know that if a giraffe did not have valves in its carotid artery, the first time that he bowed his head to take a drink, he'd be dead because a lot of pressure has to be exerted from the heart to send blood 14 feet up in the air to his brain. Just think of that. The person who made giraffes knew what he was doing before he put the first one on, on the earth. That's the person that we're talking about. Now, if this person has the kind of mind that he can do that in making a, a giraffe, I believe strongly that he could control the same hemostatic things that he made that we use every day to live normal lives, that he could use that when he, his body was being attacked from outside. If he couldn't do that, well, I don't see why we would, why we should worship him. Why should we? If he made something and he can't use it, well, what's the point? You see, so I feel very strongly that he got to the cross when he was ready. And despite all 
that happen. And we will develop that as we carry on. So stick with me for these weeks and I may shock you with some things that you never thought of before. So we have been having a lot of erroneous visual images which have affected us. And we have not necessarily, that's why the best teachers, Bible teachers, um, bring into the teaching the language, the ancient language, the history, and the culture around the events that we discuss so that people can have a more perfect grasp of the lessons. Now, unlike the other leaders of the day, Jesus never participated in paintings and sculptures, so we don't have any images of him, really. Uh, Jews of his time, they, they were not into that kind of thing. After the Babylonian captivity, they took uh, the third commandment much more seriously than they did before. And those who placed their faith in Jesus were not inspired to replicate his image. And those who did not place their faith in Jesus had no interest in doing so. So therefore, we don't have any accurate images that we can follow. We have to go by what the scripture says. There's that famous picture called The Last Supper by Da Vinci, which again shows a certain amount of ignorance and it, it has affected us. But this is the painting of a picture where the man uses a 15th century Italian hall and puts some men in first century garb into that setting. No wonder people are mock making a mockery of what they see in that painting. And then we have the Passion films by uh, Gibson, The Passion of the Cross, in which they show a wimpy Jesus, uh, you know, falling under the weight of the cross and so on. Just bear, I'm just trying to speed up uh, and teach. Sometimes I will teach, sometimes I will just read. I'm trying not to teach because if the wind gets in my sails and I teach, we're not going to finish. But this is what we have been presented with. And we want to see what the scripture says. Scripture says that he was beaten beyond recognition. That is what Isaiah 52, 14 means when it says that we were astonished at him. That is, Visar was so marred more than any other man and is far more than the sons of men. He was unrecognizable. That's what that is saying. It's very poetic, but that is what it is saying in plain, simple West Indian language. So the guys that are behind uh, presenting um, uh, and preparing uh, Sunday school manuals. They didn't think that some of the things that happened on the cross would be very politically correct, that is the word that we use today, or suitable for little children to see. So we have a certain uh, view of things. No, no for instance, uh, the, the, the Roman soldiers thought that it was necessary to ask Cy Simon of Cyrene to bear the Lord's cross. Why did they ask the, somebody to bear the cross of the other two men who were crucified that day? Was it not because they had beaten him so severely that he had lost a large amount of blood already? Now remember, these guys are professionals. These are professional torturers. These are professional beaters of people before crucifixions. That was their job. And they knew what they were seeing. Was it not because they knew that he was probably not going to get up the hill? He was so weak, carrying that cross bar. And this would deprive them of the fun that they were looking forward to, because that's what they did. Was it not because the Roman soldiers, who were experts at exacting the, min the maximum amount of torture from a prison, had this time overdone the beating? they had inflicted upon the Savior. And that's what exactly happened. Was it not because they were themselves being crucified if they were not able to carry out the orders that was given to them? It was, of course, important to Jesus, too, that he brought to the cross because the scripture says, cursed is he that hangeth on the tree. If he's going to bear the curse, he's got to get to the tree. Paul will later write about that in Galatians 3. 
10 to 13. So that is a that is a particular detail that we must duly and dutifully discuss, and we will in the physiology class. We need to understand that Jesus totally, his totally naked body was flaunted in humiliation before watching word. His flesh was ripped to shreds. His body was bruised from head to toe. He had to heave his body upward for every breath he breathed on the cloth. That's a very, that's a technical thing. And we won't go into that. That's very complex what happened there. But his nervous system was sending constant signals of excruciating pain to his brain from all over his body. Uh, 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 most of us would gone crazy. Because the, the the beating that he took, remember he was beaten more than than he ought to be, and this was not a joke beating. People died in some of those beatings. But remember, the Lord went into this ordeal in very good health. He was in the peak of condition. He was walking about for three years teaching. He had been a carpenter for for, for thirty years. The man was fit. This is another way. He was fit, and they tried to reduce him to the whip that we see in the pictures that we have. But they did not break his spirit. They did not dismiss his spirit. They did not affect his psyche. He was in control. Mankind does not like bloody scenes, and the Angoli rejects our, let's put you the word, bloody religion. You know, they don't, they, I've heard people say, your oh, religion is too, too bloody. But let us remember that it says clearly in Hebrews 9, 22, all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood, there's no remission. Now, friends, we are now well warmed up for today's exercise. I'm at the top of my mark. I hope that the time is important. And, uh, we now seek to present and reinforce truth. When we teach, what we want to do is present and reinforce truth and refute error. And it will be our prayer today that our effort will shape our prayers and thanksgiving in the future as we focus on the truth of what Jesus did for us in the day which he was crucified. Now, 50 years ago in at Grace Bible Church, where I was a disciple, we were taught in preacher boys class that a sermon must have a text. But since this is not a sermon and just a lecture, we will disobey that rule and we will have several texts. <laughs> several texts. I was tempted to sing that one for you. And you know, you know, Handel has a lovely alto aria. Uh, which you can you can transpose and sing it. I gave my back to the smiters. Very nice piece. But then there's Isaiah 52, 14. We must bear it in mind. It's going to come up over and over and over in this series. And uh, there, what, what I call this text. Well, this is the proof text. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we have seen him stricken. Smitten by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Not those words, wounded, bruised, and stripes. And then we come in Isaiah 53 and we read that it pleased the Lord to bring him to grief. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Those the word bruise again. In 2 Corinthians, he was made sin for us. He was made the worm. He was made the toxin that had to be removed as Amos removed the, the toxins from the sycamore fruit by nipping them so that they could be sweet and edible. We will address that later during the course. It is all right for, is all right for us to think about the words that Jesus gave and the works that he did. But without the special work that he did, his words and his works are meaningless. You see, it is when he nipped or was nipped as a worm 
and made sin for us and died on the cross that we might be made the righteousness of God that we can really appreciate the words that he said and the works that he did. All of those things ride and stand on the foundation of the cross work of the Lord. That's what the scripture teaches in Genesis 3 onwards. He did this in his own body. Notice where he did it? On the tree. He didn't do it in Pilate's Hall, where he got all the, all the blows that should have killed him. He died on the tree. It was a substitutionary death. We study that in 2 Corinthians 5.21. That's what that is saying. He made sin for us. He was the sin offering and the sin offerer. That's what that verse is saying. And Peter corroborates that. He says he suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that's substitutionary. That's what we want to get from those phrases that we highlight. And now we come to a point to ponder. It says he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for iniquities and it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And for a long time, I wondered at this seeming redundancy in these verses. And I was to wonder why would Isaiah say it, not say it pleased the Lord to wound him? Because Jesus received every category of wound presented in Paul's text except the defense wound. We'll discuss the defense wound today, and we'll discuss the other wounds next week, God willing. What does this verse say that the Lord would both, why does this verse say that the Lord would both be wounded and bruised? It is rare to get a wound without a bruise, as we will show in the next session, and a few of the slides today will actually show that. Bruises, also called contusions, are by far, far the most common injury, when you really think of it. There are not very wound, many wounds that you will get that is not accompanied by bruises. Is it because bruises accompany most, if not all, the other wounds that Jesus received as recorded in the biblical accounts? Or is it that he received wounds to affect the bruising that was promised in Genesis 3.15? And we know the verse. I will put M between the T, T and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. What do you think? What is a wound? A wound typically refers to an injury to the body caused by an external force that breaks the continuity of the skin or other body tissue. An injury caused by an external force, it breaks the continuity of the skin or other body tissues. And wounds are often described and classified based on the mechanism and appearance of the skin after injury. And in this paragraph is the first thing that they told us in the first lecture that I had a mona in pathology. The, the Americans teach pathology differently. They start at a different point, but this is where you have to start. The most common symptoms of a wound or any for, sort of dis-ease that you will experience, the most common symptoms are pain, swelling, bleeding, and heat. And since it is the Romans that develop what we call modern medicine, Galen, the father of medicine, he called it dolor, which is pain, the Latin for pain, tumor, which is the Latin for swelling, rubor, which is means red, and that intimates the color of blood and the color of my shirt when I'm preaching, and calor, heat. And we all know that when we get a, a wound, a lash, that we experience pain, and the area will swell because the body is sending fluid to that area with food to do repair. So that's why it swells. And it may, it may be red, especially if you, are, if you don't have much melanin in your skin. And that's blood coming, bringing 
nutrients to do the healing and heat because very, there are very few chemical reactions that happen that don't give off heat. And I will add, as you've seen on slide, according to how bad the wound is, we can add horror. And a lot of people don't like to see certain uh, sites. Um, the amount of pain and swelling depends on the location of the injury, the mechanism of the injury, and how many nerve endings are in the area that is injured. Uh, and we will look at this in detail when we look at the injuries to your scalp and face. Because I believe firmly that the injuries that he received to his head and neck and scalp alone could have killed him. And we know that that's not far fetched. Because when we were young boys and we used to follow boxing, we know that men used to get knocked out in the ring and die. I had a man I was I was teaching in I was teaching in St. Kitts one Sunday morning in 2002 about matters of the cross and the Dulos was in port. The Dulos is a floating library. It was a book, it was a missionary uh Enterprise. I don't know if it still works, but a lot of believers on it. They had a very good books. You can really, when the loss was important, you go and you get good commentaries and good Bibles and so on. So this guy was in. So when the, the boat came into port, they will deploy these floating missionaries to various churches. And I was talking about wounds to the face, the Lord's having wounds to the face. And he said, this man got up and said that he received a lash in his face. He was from the Faurier Islands, that is to the uh, north uh, west of England, and he got a lash with a boom in his face, and he had to be transfused four pints of blood to save his life. Four pints from just one lash in the face. So when we talk about the, the wounds that Jesus received in his scalp and face alone, those should have killed him in violation. Judgment Hall. If he was not God, if he did not make the compensatory mechanisms that we use to survive when we get injured, he would not have made it to the cross and therefore not fulfill all of the scriptures that said that curse, you see, who hangs on the tree. He was cursed. He bore the curse. He addressed the curse that was put on us when he went to the tree. He had to go to the tree. He had to be in control to get there. And that's what I want you to understand. If you don't understand anything else I said, you want to get that. He's Lord of all conditions and situations. Something that is often lost with us because you know who we are. You know how we are. But he's always Lord. All the time, every time, even in the midst of all those trials. In the next section, session, we will discuss in detail the various wounds we just received today. We just going to say a little bit first about the defense wounds. Uh, the scripture definitely says that he was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. He did not open his mouth, which was the reason why he got that, one of the reasons why he got that beating. Because the Roman soldiers delighted in victims screaming and shouting when they were beaten. But he opened not his mouth. And this made him angry. Remember sometimes, fellas, when your daddy or your mommy you put a few lashes on you, on your big brother, and that boy, big sister, and they just stood up and took the blows and they didn't cry one bit. And their parents, they kept beating on that boy or that girl and you just stood there like this. It, you know, it was like, oh, what on the duck's back? But that's what happened. And those guys, they went overboard. But they were not dealing with me or you. They were, the, they were dealing with the creator. 
He made the compensatory mechanisms. He knew the scriptures. He was fulfilling scripture. And he was going to do, and he could do, everything or whatever it takes to do what he came to do. That's the point we're making. If you get that point, don't worry with all the lovely ball points. He was not driven or dragged or drugged when he went to the cross. In fact, when he was offered a drink, which had an anesthetic, he refused it. Remember that. We'll come to that in physiology class. Uh, Peter corroborates this. He says when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not. And if there's anybody who can know that was Peter. Peter cut off the fellow's ear. Peter wasn't aiming at his ear. He was aiming at his head. He cut his ear off. And the Lord put the ear back off. Just think of the hardness of men's hearts. That man who had his ear cut off, he still continued in his arrest of the Lord and in the mockery and so on when he went to, to, to Caiaphas' uh, uh, place. So when Peter says that when he was reviled, speaking of the Lord, that he reviled not again, and that when he suffered, he threatened not, he knew what he was talking about because he was there and he saw it. Here are examples of typical defense wounds on the forearm of a victim of an assault with a sharp weapon producing lacerations. For 20 years, I was an actor. That is, I acted. They never gave me the job. I acted as a medical officer for the police and medical officer of the prison. So when somebody was accused of murdering somebody, when I was acting, I got to see that person. And knowing that such a person is probably going to cause me to end up in the courts to give evidence for the crown, and that person is very likely to want to present as his defense that he was defending himself. One had to examine the person's limbs and write in the public medical journal, it had to be recorded there, so you could produce it in court, that he had no defense wounds. Do you know on the right of screen, you can see the laceration that this person got defending himself. But what you need to note is not that. I want you to know is not that laceration. I want you to see all the red and all the blue in that person's skin. Right? He received a laceration, and with it, there is bruising. In the pictures next week, you, you better see, you'll see it again and again. Why the scripture is making all about this fuss, about bruising, about bruising, and not saying wounding and wounding and wounding. Because all wounds, or nearly all wounds, carry with them bruising. But all bruising is not wounds. We skip this one. So defense wounds can also present as fractures. But the scriptures are very clear that none of Jesus' bones were broken. And that is one of the main planks of the lesson today. The Roman guards received great enjoyment at seeing a prisoner beg for mercy, and they kept beating the Lord. They battered his head, they, they battered his body, but he had no broken bones or a fulfillment of prophecy. He had no broken bones. He did not even have a broken nose or a fractured zygomatic bones. We can show those in a minute. That was a miracle. That was a very big miracle. Just think of it. I put you in a chair. Or to stand up and I cover your head and I get 12 strong men to beat on your head with their hands and they don't, break, they, they don't break your nose. But sometimes you're just playing with your friends and you just, you know, make a gesticulation. I hit him in his nose, he fell out broken nose. 
Who is in control here, friends? These things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. The Holy Spirit gives us in Psalm 24, 20, he keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Marvelously had this been fulfilled. God kept all the bones of his incarnate son intact because God was in control. This was a miracle. So you can put this in, in your book of miracles. This is, you didn't see it before, but there's a miracle. The Lord was beaten all of his face. He done broken bones. Wow. We're going we're gonna to have to look into this because this is the big issue. The common method of hastening death in the crucifixion was to break the legs of the victim. It was customary for Roman soldiers to break the lower leg bones of a person being crucified in a procedure called crucifracture or crucifragrum. This would accomplish two things. It would rupture the femoral arteries and veins and cause significant blood loss, or it would prevent the, 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 the victim from pushing up from his legs to take a, a deep breath. That's something that we'll have to address not today in another session because that's very, it's a very complex thing. I think I have some, some notes on it today, but we'll probably skip it for the sake of time. This picture shows the blood supply to the legs on the right of your screen. The red is the, the femoral artery coming down off, off the aorta and the iliac bone is coming down to give blood to the lower limbs. And on the, the other side is a communicating artery. That is very good. And it shows how smart the Lord is. So if something blocks the femoral artery higher up, that artery will actually take over. So you can see that if you break that bone, you'll see it in the x-ray that we show, you can probably sever these arteries. And you can bleed a lot into your thighs if you break your femoral artery. And on the right or left of your screen, the blue shows the, the, uh, the blood drainage of the leg. And you can see that they have a number of prominent veins coming up from the leg. That's the point of the picture. The point of the picture show that when they broke the, they would break the legs of victims, they, if they didn't bleed out, they certainly won't be able to breathe out. That is the that was the torture, the torture of a, a crucifixion, difficulty in breathing, suffocation, leading to final suffocation. Here we have two X-rays of a fracture fever, and the one on right to screen we show you can see those sharp edges of the the, the lower part of the femur, and you can see that these could definitely uh, cut blood vessels. Jesus' bones were not broken. All the legions of Caesar could not have broken a single bone of the Lord because just like Pete Pilate, they also had no power except what was given from above. And this, this issue of, of not having any fractures is a big issue. So bear with me as we pursue this. The preservation of Christ's bones was the fulfillment of an ancient given in Exodus 12, 46, which pointed out that neither shall you break a bone thereof. And of course, we're talking about the Paschal Lamb. The Paschal Lamb is what? A picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Numbers 9, 12, we see it again. They must not leave any of the lamb until the next morning, and they must not break any of his bones. They must follow the regulations concerning the Passover, one of those was not to break the bones. For 1,500 years, Israel had punctiliously observed this item in the Passover observance. And none of them, it seemed, as far as we know, had any idea of how important, this, how important this was. Now the Holy Spirit will explain it. So we, know, we must now explain three things. The irony of why no crucifracture was inflicted on Jesus. The reason why Jesus did not suffer that crucifracture. And at the same time, we will look at the final wound that Jesus received on the cross in order to explain 
the significance of both of these closely related incidents and observed that one was the consequence of the other. Instead of Jesus' legs being broken, his sight was pierced. It was pierced, as clearly stated in John 19. The irony of why no crucifixion was inflicted. Let's read from John's gospel. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a holy day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. The irony here is that the Jews were not concerned that they had broken their own law by falsely accusing a man and had repeatedly done so in several illegally convened trials throughout the night when they knew full well that trials could not happen at night and all the Sanhedrin was not there according to all accounts and historical records and at these trials they deceitfully sought the death penalty for what they knew was not a capital offense as Pilate told them however they were more concerned about breaking another law, which that situation would not have arisen if not had, they had not broken in the first place the laws that we just mentioned that they broke. They, they, they were true politicians. Why did Jesus not suffer crucifixion? The soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break, they did not break his legs. And verse 36 goes on to say, these things were done that the scriptures should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. If you're smart, you will have recognized by now that I always put the scripture text in green, right? Green means life. So the word brings life. So I always in my four points. Uh, tend to put the scriptures in green. So even if you don't want to read the rest of stuff that I've written, you must read green, okay? At least read green. Okay, friends? <laughs> Jesus did not suffer crucifixion because one, it was not necessary to do so because he was already dead, but it was necessary that a prophetic scripture should be fulfilled by not doing so. That was the point. It was necessary that his bones not be broken. This is a big issue. It has great significance. When the soldiers came to break Jesus' legs, he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. They said the pierces. Sorry. And on this, doing this, blood and water gushed from Jesus' said. Sorry. That is how they knew that he was dead. This is a very important point. Mark that scripture down and learn it and inwardly digest it. After certifying Jesus' death, the soldiers broke the legs of the other prisoners so that this would hasten their, their suffocation. Remember that persons crucified would often stay on the cross for up to seven days. Two and three days was fairly common. It was a slow, lingering death by suffocation and usually victims in their full strength did not expire until the sixth or seventh day the people often meant seven days but this particular crucifixion occurred on the day of a jewish sabbath called the preparation the jews were anxious to satisfy the letter of the law that they didn't really understand i set out in deuteronomy 21 23 which asserts that the body of a person executed and hang on the tree must not remain all night by the tree, but must be buried the same day of the execution. In addition, on this occasion, there was another Sabbath coming soon that was also a high day. So in their anxiety to keep this law, since the two thieves which were crucified with Jesus were not expected to die that day, the Jews had gone to Pilate early in the afternoon to seek permission to accelerate the deaths of these crucified that day by the terrible additional punishment of crucifixion. And Pilate had permitted 
this to happen. At the same time, Pilate learned via Joseph of Arimathea, who came to ask for Jesus' body, that Jesus was dead. And he marveled at this, that he was dead so soon, because that was not the purpose of a crucifixion. The purpose of a crucifixion was to cause you to suffer, to be tortured as you couldn't breathe. Jesus' bones were not broken, so that scripture was fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. In the providence of God, this is further evidence was given of the reality of Christ's death that contradicts the opinion of the skeptics who say otherwise. And that's something that we have to press. If the skeptics would say that when they put Jesus in the cave, he, he wasn't there anyhow. He assumed he went unconscious. And when they put him in the cave, the nice pool left in there uh, revived. He was not dead. That's what the scriptures, the, the skeptics would say. But we're going to examine that. And I want you to get that because this is this is considered serious pathognomonic evidence that he was dead. We're going to get to that. The fact that both criminals would have their legs broken while those of the Lord will be left intact is also a very remarkable piece of information, considering that in 90% of all crucifixions, the executioner did not break the legs of those on the cross. The executioners preferred you to stay there for seven days and suffer. So they don't break the legs. Why are they going to do that? They're going to lose out on their sport. This day, they were forced to do it because the Jews were interested in the law that they wanted to keep, whereas they were in a situation where the night before they were breaking a number of laws. So remember Exodus 12, 46, Numbers 9, 12, remember Psalm 34, 20. I know when we put that with what we read in John's Gospel, we are seeing what? The harmony of the scriptures. And we are also speaking about plenary inspiration and authorship of the scripture. And there are the proof texts. They want to know these. This is the proof, proof text. You want to talk about plenary inspiration of scriptures? You have to know these two scriptures. That's what we call the proof text. The divine author of this prophecy knew in advance that this crucifixion would occur just before the start of the Jewish Sabbath, which would require the legs of the crucified to be broken and yet leave the bones of the crucified Messiah unbroken. I hope that you will get the four point. It will be distributed or whatever. And you will meditate on this. Go to the serious point. So people who would think that the Bible is, you know, just another book, it doesn't make a lot of sense anyway. It doesn't make a lot of sense if you don't want the spirit anyway, but, but this is exciting. The person who wrote the Bible knew a day would come when two men on the cross would have their legs broken, despite the fact that 90% of crucifixion, this did not happen. That is a point to point. The final wound that Jesus received in the cross was the penetrating wound. And these can extend into the internal organ or body cavity. This is where the spear went. You note that the, it went into the right side of the heart, the right ventricle. The left ventricle is just behind, around the corner from what you can see. And you can see the positioning of the heart. Uh, between the second and the sixth and the fourth spaces. The final woe that Jesus received on the cross is recorded in John 19.34. One of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and forthwith came there out blood and water. This particular penetrating wound is incontrovertible medical evidence of great forensic significance because it proves that Jesus died a physical death on the cross. 
This fact is important, conclusive, post-mortem evidence that Jesus died, despite what the skeptics might think. Let's say it again. This is incontrovertible medical evidence of great forensic significance. When Josh McDonald wrote his, his book on apologetics, he went to some of the best lawyers and judges in the nation, and he wrote his book, uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. In other words, the evidence demands a particular ver verdict, the verdict being that Jesus died. The men who examined what he said, and these are prominent uh, jurist, jury, ju jurist men, they realized that the, the information that was presented, you had to come to one conclusion, that he had died. Okay? But this particular verse, it, that's a linchpin. That is a linchpin. Let's say what it says. The medical significance of the blood and water has been a matter of debate. One expert says that the spirit to the right side of the heart would allow fluid built up of the lungs to escape first. I, I don't know that. Uh, followed by a flow of blood from the right wall the right ventricle. But I want you to understand. The order of blood and water has nothing to do with the order of appearance. I just show you a picture of where the heart is. And if I should show you another picture, which I did put in the original uh, PowerPoint, I cut it off for time. You'll find that the lungs does not cover that the heart is that place. So the, the lungs is not in the in the in, in, in the picture at, at all. But what is important here is the relative prominence and theological importance of each portion. We're talking about what? Blood, that is the blood cells, and water, that is the serum. You know that most of what would drain out your body if you had a cut, 90% of that is really water. Most of it is water. We call it the plasma. And in it are the blood cells. Why is that important? Well, there's a rule from Leviticus 17. It still holds. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. It is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. That's why we stress that Jesus shed his blood. When the soldiers pierce his side, the blood elements had already separated from the plasma. That means he was dead. The only time that your plasma is going to be separated from your blood cells is when you're dead. That is accepted forensically in all places of the globe, regardless of who is in power or what language is. You got it? Blood theorem and the blood elements are separated at death. And when you take that frozen chicken out, your, out the, the freezer and leave it on your desk, your top, your countertop in the kitchen. For a while, you will notice the separation. You will notice the separation. And they will tell you something. That's a dead chicken that you're dealing with, okay? The next point we want to make it down at the bottom of the page in, in, uh, in, in, in uh, purple. I, I use in purple as my, my, my point thing today. The soldier who had received instructions to break the legs of Christ, he did not do this because he didn't need to. But if he had done so, scripture would have been broken. The soldier didn't know what he would do. The soldier reasoned the man dead already. They're not point breaking the man's leg. So that worked for him too. But if he had done so, if he'd gone ahead and done it, he would have broken this prophecy. 
though he had not received orders to pierce the Savior's side, he did it. Because he thought that that was the best thing to do. Had he done so, this prophecy would have failed of its partial fulfillment. Had he not done so, the soldier didn't break the legs. He didn't know what he doing. All he know is that this is the best thing to do. He fell dead. What, what's the point of breaking his legs? And I want to find out if he's really dead. So I got to I got to put a hole in his heart and see what's going to happen. And he know that when he put that spirit in his heart, he know exactly what's going to come out. What's going to come out? Blood and water. And when you see blood and water coming out like that from a heart, you know the person from whom it is coming is dead. That's the point that we're making. If you done one, scripture will not be fulfilled. When he did the other, if you had not done the second one, he will fail in partial fulfillment. Do you fellas could tell me you want me to stop because we, we just about halfway. So these scriptures, he protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. So now we can come to be coming up to the punchline on this on this bone breaking situation. The scripture that John quotes in John 1937 is, of course, from Zechariah 12, 10, which refers to a coming day when Israel shall look upon him whom he appears. At the cross, they pierce it, though the, though the act was performed by a Roman. Let us observe the minute accuracy of scripture. In John 19, 36, the word fulfill is suitably used. But in John 19.37, it is significantly absent because the complete fulfillment of Zechariah 12.10 is yet future. And so the phrase is, another scripture says, he doesn't say it is fulfilled. That's very important. This is, and that, and Zechariah 12.10, as you know, the very uh, important uh, scripture that that pertains to the, to the eschaton. When the Lord comes, that's when the Jews will. Notice that is the person that repairs and they will be converted on that. That's not yet fulfilled. So the Holy Spirit does not have John to say that that section was fulfilled. But because he knew the scripture, he ponders about it. He pondered about it and brought that to our attention. And we must be similarly accurate when we divide the word of truth. What was the significance why Jesus was not subjected to pussy fracture? That's very significant. Jesus was beaten, he was nailed, he was pierced, he was crucified, he was killed. And though his bones were even exposed, the prophecy that his bones would not be broken was fulfilled. Why was it so important that his bones not be broken? The answer lies in the integrity of the Lord's body, the very people of God who are of his bones. Adam spoke for Jesus, and we mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. The brother mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. And the church, brethren, when he said in Genesis 2, 23, of Eve, who is a type of the church, Adam said, she is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. And we were able to show that when Adam took the rib, that that was significant. Because that was a, a stem, you could call it a stem tissue. It, it's from, from the bones, you can generate the blood. And the principle that will be enunciated later in Scripture and come right through to us is that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And the blood is made in the bones. You can't break the bones. Um, Christ church is also intended to remain unbroken and not be shattered into splinters as it has been done since uh, 83, around 8313 or so. Branches to splinter, splinter, splinter. That's why we're not doing what we should be doing as the early church did. The early church was able to stand persecution. 
And when the Romans saw that they can destroy the church by persecution, they decided to use compromise. I was taught as a child that compromise is sin on the installment plan. Compromise is sin on the installment plan. It is sacrificing the permanent on the altar of the immediate. We are all guilty of that. We know about that. Anyway, it is God's will that the body of Christ, the church, not be broken apart. It is his will that the true body of believers be unified in love and the spirit. Unified, not uniform, two different things. Being of one mind with each other, as taught in Ephesians 4, and I think we can also appeal to Philippians 1.27. We're supposed to be in one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. We're supposed to be unified. We can't be unified. If we are broken, the church of God is not to be broken. It is to be prepared in unity and oneness to be the bride who will be have who will have made herself ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now you're going to get married tomorrow. You don't want your wife to be like Alouette. The, we used to have a group of this it was the Trinidad Posse. A set of guys would come up from. Clean that every year, the test match, and they will sit in front the member stand or so, and they will sing about Alouette. And that was a, a funny song. I don't know if you ever heard it, but she's got uh, broke false teeth and, and, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, she's broken. She's all broken up. But th that's not the, the, the that's not the, the person you want for your bride. You don't want Alouette for your bride. So why should the Lord want an Alouette church? That's the point we make. The church of God is not broken. The question has been asked, what, what, wasn't Jesus' body broken to make payment for healing? Note, the scriptures reveal that for spiritual healing, Jesus received stripes. He received stripes. He did not receive broken bones. The scriptures particularly says that not a bone would be broken. And there's no record that even his nose bone was not, was broken. Even when he got a severe beat into his face. So don't let anybody tell you anything about, about broken bones. The Lord's bones are broken, and, and that's how we get here. It says stripes, not bones. The word says in Isaiah 53, 5, by whose stripes we were healed. And this is speaking about spiritual healing, not physical. There is no healing in the atonement, as some teach today. We've got to get these things right, because some of this rubbish is taught, I've heard it taught, in gospel halls. It upsets me. We need to understand also that the King James translators, and you know, brother, the brother is always on about translations and getting right translations. If you fail to got that in and the Friday night meetings, I'm sorry, but you must probably beg for those recordings. The King James translators, not realizing the significance of Jesus' bones remaining unbroken, as thought in Exodus 12, 46, and the other scriptures that we mentioned, incorrectly embellish the Greek text by adding the words, which is broken to the original text of 1 Corinthians 11, 23, 24. The scripture there correctly rendered should say, the Lord Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, this is my body for you. This doing remembers of me. It's not broken. His body was not broken. And his church is not supposed to be broken either. Jesus brought unleavened bread that represents his body. And the Greek cloud means only to break bread. As when he broke bread in the miracle of the laws and the fishes. As in Acts 2, 46, when the saints, the early saints, broke bread from house to house and they eat their food of gladness and sing of heart. Jesus was beaten with stripes. He was crucified and he died, but his bones were not broken. As clearly stated in John 19, 33. 
democracies. This incredible symbolism has tremendous significance for us today. Paul went to great lengths to prophesy that Jesus would receive stripes, but none of his bones were broken. David was inspired by God to give us the messianic psalm in 34 psalm. He keepeth all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Scripture reveals that we, the saints of God, are also represented by the bones of Jesus Christ, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Ephesians 5.30. Now, I, I interpret scripture literally. Some people say, but she is a man. You can't interpret it literally. But I love Cooper's law. When the plain sense makes common sense, seek no other saints. When we read the newspaper, or the Harlequin romance, or Mills and Boons, or Louis Amour, or whatever you read, you read it with common sense. You interpret the words properly, and you use all the figures of speech that they are. So when you come to read the Bible, what are you going to do? Not do the same? As the future wife of Christ, the church of God are of his bones, just as Eve was born of Adam's bones. Jesus' bones were not broken so that we, the church, may be one. So we see that in fulfillment of prophecy, Jesus received no defensive injuries, no crucifixion, no broken bones at all, not even a broken nose or broken zygomatic bones. And in the picture on the right, this is a lovely uh, uh, picture which shows the different bones that compose, that are composite of the face. Look at the different bones. So many different bones that make up the face. And Jesus face was battered, and not one of those bones was broken. Now the miracle, understand this, this is a serious matter. There's a zygomatic bone, those to put those two on the side. You know, that's the one that makes good looking or handsome or not so handsome, you know. It depends on how prominent those bones are. It has a lot to do with ethnicity. Those ones, the ones on the side, the ones that are purple, that's the zygomatic bone. But none of these bones are broken. Not one. The Bible particularly predicted, though, in Psalm 22, 14. This is one of the major uh, verses in the Psalm there that is, that is pathological. It said, all my bones are out of joint. And since Jesus endured joint dislocations and fulfilled the promise, we ought to discuss them. Oh, what's going wrong here now? Something's going wrong. Oh, sorry. Although none of his bones are broken, a fulfillment of God's instruction. The weight of Jesus' body on the cross would have caused dislocation of all his joints except the temporal mandibular joint in the face. I said joint, not bone, which was caused by the trauma of battery to his face. And we must, and we will discuss this too, because this one is important because. I don't know why I would want how the Lord could say the things that he said on the cross with both sides of his face out of order, the joints out of order. What was the first thing he said? Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It was difficult to breathe at that time. And he was in severe pain. It was bilateral, dislocated, temporal, mandibular joints. I will skip the next couple of slides for time um, so that we can get to the the TM joint. Uh, we all just want to notice that when 
we we'll probably bring this up again that when he was nailed to the cross, he was not nailed in his palms, as you see in the picture. He was nailed. The nails were put between the uh, the wrist joint, and this would have impacted on the nerves that you can see at the right of the screen, especially the median nerve. Those are three nerves that go to the hand. They're coming from up with the shoulder, up and the neck. So the pain is not only going to be felt down by the fingers, it's going to be felt up in the neck. That is what's called referred pain. And all of those, all of us boys who played a little bat and ball in our time know about referred pain. When you play forward and you miss, you feel it in your heart, up by your heart. I mean, you feel it open too, but you feel it up by your heart. That's a referred pain. You know it, fellas? You remember that? Well, he's going to receive referred, referred pain. He's going to feel pain down his arm, but he's going to feel it up in the neck because these nerves actually arise up in the neck. So I hope you get the four point. You just to, to get the, the whole the whole issue, or we probably bring it back under 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 um, physiology uh, why he would have the difficulties. And so we see this is what the dislocated uh, ankle, uh, sorry, sorry, uh, wrist joint will look like. And this uh, is what the dislocated shoulder joint will look like. Shoulder joint is a, is a ball and socket joint. And uh, if you see there, there's a that black hole. You can see if I don't know if you can see it on my uh, mouse. That's the glenoid cavity. And that's where the head of the the uh, the humerus is supposed to be. It's not there yeah. in this picture on the right. We, we can see it. We can see it. Good. Right. It's not on the right of the screen. So he has a dislocated shoulder. Yeah. And it can be dislocated forwardly, anterior dislocation, or it can be dislocated backwardly. Uh, I must, I, I, give me a minute to give you a little joke. Uh, when, the, when the Americans invaded uh, Grenada in 1984, they, they, they brought the St. George's School up to Barbados, and the school was housed in uh, the convent at St. George's Hospital where I was working. And they brought up a boy who had a dislocated shoulder. I mean, I was a young doctor, and all his colleagues came to see what the doctor was going to do about their friend. And the doctor had never seen a dislocated shoulder before. <laughs> so he went down the corner to his little room where he slept and he took up a little book and he read what should be done and he went back and did it and click the thing went into place the doctor was of course surprised and all of the, the boy was rejoicing and all his colleagues thought that the doctor was a genius which was not true anyway <laughs> I hope you got to the last and that, you know, that they don't the pressure of this immense, on this uh, intense lecture. So forgive me. This is a X-ray of a dislocated knee joint. You can see on the top of the right of the X-ray, the patella, and below, you can see the tibia fibula, and dislocated backwards is the distal end of the femur. So now we come, and we're going to come home now, friends. We know in the last lap, we enter in the stadium. This is where the point where you start to take your diabetic tablets because this is sweet. This gets very, very, very sweet. And I do not want you to go into hyper or smaller diabetic ketosis. So if you have not taken your sugar tablets today, Take some now, and if you don't ever take any, take some now, because this is sweet. This will make you cry and all that, because this is really, this is very moving, this section. Now, Psalm 22, 14 predicted that all the Lord's bones will be out of joint. And we just mentioned some of the ways that the others would go to joint. And they really went out of joint when they drop the sidebar onto the pole that bore up, that would bear up the cross. But the temporal mandibular joint was located because of trauma, trauma to the face. The TM joint is located just in front of the lower part of the ear. So if you will put your fingers to just below your ear and open your mouth, like if you're eating or speaking, you will feel it moving. This is the joint that allows the lower jaw to move. It is the ball and socket joint, just like the hip joint or the shoulder joint. 
when the mouth opens wide, the ball, called the condyle, comes out of the socket and moves forward. It goes back into place when the ball closes. The TNG becomes dislocated when the condyle moves too far forward. Then it gets stuck in front of a section of bone called the articular eminence, which you just showed, it soon showed. The condyle can't move back into place then. This happens most often when the ligaments that normally keep the condyle in place are somewhat loose. The surrounding muscles often go into spasm and hold the condyle in the dislocated position. Now, I want you to know that the, when we talk about these muscles, there are six big muscles in the face. The six biggest muscles in the face are connected to the jaw. It seems to keep some people in the church's mouth open and they keep talking and they use it all rubbish. And I don't apologize for that because I do get upset when people get up and talk mess and rubbish in church meetings. Uh, everybody wants to be a teacher, but if you want to teach, you've got to study. And James has a lot to say about that in chapter three of his book. So we need to be able to put some injections into the TM joints of some of our members. And there is the TM joint on the right of your screen. You can see the normal. You, got, you see the head of the ramus. The, this is the mandibular bone. You can see the head. He's in his place. Over here, he is out of his place. He's not in the glenoid force. That's the glenoid force. So that's where he's supposed to be. He's not there. He's forward. And if you can't get him back there, you're going to be in trouble. In the case of Jesus, it was beaten out of place on both sides. The scripture says that all of his joints were out of place. That's what it means. All means all. As my father used to say, O double L, all. When he wanted to emphasize that he meant all, he used to say, O double L, all. And that's what's happened here. All the joints were out of place including the temporal mandibular joint. Right, we use that joint for? For speaking, we use it for eating, right? When the temporal mandibular joint becomes out of joint, it gets stuck and locked in an open position and there's difficulty to open and close the mouth. And there's great discomfort until the joint returns to the proper position. There's pain in the face. And I talk about all over the face, in the next lecture, we will show the nerve supply to the face and the jaw and the ear, and you will understand what's happening. The headaches, there's earaches, and pain and pressure behind the eyes because the face, the face is supplied by the fifth cranial nerves, which has three roots. So it's going to affect all of the nerves of the face. There will be tenderness of the jaw muscles because the six muscles that keep that work that jaw will go into spasm. We call it tetany, not tetanus. Tetanus is infection. Tetany is when you've got muscles contracting, 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 contracting because they're in trouble. When you've got this kind of situation, you don't want to speak too much. It must have been difficult for Jesus to speak with dislocated bilateral temporal mandible when he comforted those fearful women called the daughters of Jerusalem when he was on the way to the cross. These are probably women that had come down from Galilee and who supported him and who followed him, who believed in him. But he, but he, but he took the time off to speak to them. Just think of that. Would you want to know and be associated with somebody like that? Would you? He may have remained silent for much of the time that he hung on the cross because of the fact that he had both jaws dislocated as a result of this severe beating he suffered to his face, as described in Matthew 26. I wish Isaiah comments on by saying his visage was marred more than any man. We must understand that it was extremely painful and more difficult for him to speak with the dislocated bilateral. Bilateral means on both sides. And that everything he said on the cross was done with both jaws dislocated. And in an imaginable pain. 
I'm not going to get into the other joints that were dislocated because this is the one that speaks to our hearts. So all what he said while on the cross is of great significance and worthy of serious consideration and shall impact our lives appropriately. We will discuss one of these things now, only one, and the one at the end. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him, and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When the soldiers hung Jesus on the cross, at the height of his physical suffering, remember the person has been beaten and been bleeding all over, not like the pictures that you have been seeing, he's bleeding all over, and he's got all of these wounds, and all of these nerves are sending messages to the brain. I mean, when you overload certain circuits, the circuits burst. Be talking about overloaded circuits. Nobody's ever been beaten all over his body like that. And he's suffering. And he's fulfilling the prophecy, still fulfilling prophecy, friends, that he would make intercession for the transgressors. 53 12, Isaiah 53 12. He's going to make intercession for the transgressors. His love prevailed. And looking down at the Roman soldiers throwing dice for a seamless garment. With two dislocated jaws, he said, Father, forgive. This is one of the most remarkable statements in all of Scripture. Right up to his final hours on earth, Jesus exemplified forgiveness. In our human mind, it is almost impossible to imagine that Jesus to pray for the people who tortured him. But it makes sense that the first word of Jesus from the cross is a word of forgiveness. Because that is the point of the cross. We must remember forgiveness was the reason Jesus came. And the reason that he willingly died on the cross. After all, Jesus suffered and died on the cross so that we might be forgiven for all sins and be reconciled to God. For eternity, remember, we can't reconcile ourselves to God. God reconciled us to himself. Always get that straight. Of course, the brother will come on to reconciliation sometime later. But we can't reconcile ourselves to God. A lot of people are preaching about reconciling yourself to God. You cannot reconcile yourself to God. You have to put yourself in the position at the foot of the cross so that God can reconcile himself to you. God is the reconciler. We are the reconcilees. You must get that right. Jesus spoke this love of God without blemish, offered himself up as the perfect sacrifice for the sin of the world, and as he was dying as our substitute, he basically said, forgive them and condemn me. That's what he's basically saying. No one knows how many times he prayed that prayer on the cross that afternoon because the verb is in the imperfect text in the Greek, indicating that it was a continuous action in past implying he kept it up. He may have verbalized it once, but he may have been praying it in his mind all evening, just like we often pray silently. Just imagine that. Just imagine, to his pain, just looked down for the cross, just as he was crucified between the two criminals. He saw the Roman soldier who mocked, scourged, and tortured him, and who were just nailed to the cross, and even while they were gambling for his blood, he prayed, for their forgiveness. By saying they didn't know what they were doing, he meant that the soldiers did not understand the full impact of what they were doing. They thought they were just doing the same job they did every day, hanging some criminals. They did not know that they were crucifying the very Son of God, the Lord of glory. They did not realize who, was, who Jesus was until after his death. But the centurion said, this was the Son of God. People don't die like this. Jesus was not only praying for the Roman soldiers, but he was praying for the religious leaders who had condemned and sent him. He was praying for his own, who had abandoned him. 
I mean, his, his people, he was uh, praying for his apostles who had deserted them. He was praying for Peter who had denied him. He had prayed for the fickle crowd who had praised him at the beginning of the week and now were mingling with those spitting at him. He was praying for the criminals beside him and he was praying for you and for me who daily forget him in our lives. We have been guilty of that as we have gone about our day. I know what it is to be an idolater and I know what it is to be more consumed with my real estate empire, building that than in taking my position in assembly life for many years. He was praying for me too. Do you understand, friends? Father, forgive them. May we understand that we too are forgiven through Christ. And let's go back to that wonderful scripture in, in Romans 3. God is seeking to justify the unjustifiable and the unjust. And he chose away John 3, 24. That, that is a mind-boggling scripture. Which enables John to write in 1 John 1, 9. If he confess all sins, he's faithful or he is consistent and just. He has earned the right. He's not doing it out of what have he done because he earned the right. He earned the right at the cross. That's why we came just, just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Because Christ died on the cross for us, we are cleansed from all wickedness, from every last sin. We are united with God the Father as his beloved children. We are now free to approach his throne of grace with our needs and concerns because he has removed our sins as far as he is, is from the west. We are all familiar about the cross. You're coming home, friends. You're coming home. This is the last lap. Now, on the cross in John 19, 30, that Jesus said with his bilateral dislocation of his temporal mandibular joints, remember he's still on the cross, still on those bad joints. He said, Tatalistai, it is finished. And he used this verb, telio, to complete or to conclude. And let's look at four verses where that verb is used so that we can get the full weight of what he is saying. In Matthew 11, says, it came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his 12 disciples. That TDO is used there. He had made an end of teaching. It's coming to the end of his, uh, his, his um, earthly ministry. What does that say? That was that TDO said. There is nothing more to be said about our sins and guilt. For he made an end of these on the cross. Nothing more to be said. Same word is used by him in Luke 22, 37, when he asserted that all that is written must be accomplished. Since all the work that his father gave him was accomplished, that is, as Hebrews 9, 26 says, he appeared once. He could now sit down, for there's nothing more to be accomplished. One of the hymns I learned as a child, and I didn't understand what I was singing then, but it always flashed back into my brain. There's a, a lovely hymn that we sang in the old church. Once, comma, only once, comma, and once for all his precious bloody shed. The man who wrote that hymn obviously understood what Hebrews 9, 26 said. Once, only once, and once for all. His precious blood, he said. There's nothing more to be done to be accomplished, friends. In Matthew 17, when he was asked, does, when he was asked, does your master pay tribute? Chilio. Yes, payment was made by giving his precious blood when he appeared once. And now he can sit down, as we read in Hebrews 1, 3. When he had purged our sins, he sat down. Priest didn't sit down. There were no tears in the tabernacle. Their, their jobs were unending. But he made one sacrifice for sin. And he sits down. For there's nothing more to be paid. In Luke 2.39, 2, as a child went at the purification, it was asked, 
or is that all things were performed according to the law. Well, we can attest this morning that there's nothing left for our Lord to perform, and that is that all things well. And now that he's appeared once, he can now sit down. We say it again, for there's nothing more to be done. He has fulfilled the law completely. So when Jesus died on the cross and spoke with his bilateral displays, temporal man did the joy. He said it is finished. He could say so. Because with regard to all sin and shame and sin's curse, there's nothing more to be said. There's nothing more to be accomplished. There's nothing more to be paid. There's nothing more to be done. This was not a cry of exhaustion, friends. This was a cry of victory. And if you read the psalm over and over and over, you've got to read it several, several times so it makes sense. You will come to the end and see that it is about praise. It is an exercise in praise. The purpose for which Jesus came was fulfilled. Redemption for the sins of the world had been accomplished. Jesus had dealt with the curse. Satan said it's crushed. The story, of course, does not end there. The greatest event that separates Jesus from all others is the fact that he rose again and he lives today and he intercedes at the right hand of the Father for all of us who believe in him and follow him as taught in Hebrews 7, 25. Let us give thanks. And I'm going to ask the brother, Brother Fraser, to give thanks for us. Please give thanks for us, our Brother Fraser. Our oh, Father, we stand amazed. We stand amazed just to hear one session of what you permit your son to go through so that we could give you thanks in class here today. We thank you for having used our dear brother. We had asked you to do that and to enable him, and we thank you for that. And we thank you for the opportunity to, to be reminded, to be informed of things that are truly important to us that we never heard, we never understood, but we now understand. We give you thanks. Unlike the disciples on the road to Emmaus, we would plead with you and ask you to tarry with us when we come back next week again. Lead us by your grace, by your spirit. Reignite our love for him. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. Draw us closer to thyself. So we exalt Jesus and pray in his name. Amen. Amen.